My name is uh, Frederick Enkelt and I work in a company called TypeSafe. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, uh, we, have, uh, we just started and um, we're giving commercial support for, uh, for Scala. So uh, before I'm starting, I'm just going to give a bit of warning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm gonna go uh, through a lot of slides, a lot of code. So uh, I understand if, if you don't understand everything, you should um, come ask me afterwards or um, have a look at the resources which I'm presenting at the end of the talk. Um, also, just so I know, uh, so have everybody here uh, heard about Scala? Or, yeah, almost everybody. And how many is using it? Like usually, ah, that's. So there's not that many who's using it. What's wrong with you who have heard about Scala? I'm not using it. <laughs> oh, yeah, something to do there. Uh, all right, so um, just a bit about TypeSafe. So um, uh, we have um, a stack, the TypeSafe stack, which we're uh, giving commercial support for. Uh, it's comprised of um, the Scala core and the Scala libs, and uh, a module called Akka, which I'm going to, to talk about later on. And uh, we're also doing uh, heavy development in uh, some tools for Akka, uh, namely um, Eclipse, uh, the Eclipse IDE and the build plugin or build tool for Scala, which is called SPT. So uh, Scala, uh, well, as most of you would know, since you've already heard about it, it's a, a concise and statically typed language uh, that unifies uh, object-oriented programming and functional programming, and that runs on the JVM. So uh, if you see here, uh, <laughs> if you see here, we have uh, we're sort of trying to merge uh, four different concepts into one language. We're merging the object-oriented nature uh, and the functional uh, functional programming. So uh, uh, why would we do that? Uh, the reason why we think that is good is because um, um, well, object-oriented uh, programming, as you know, is a very good way of uh, composing uh, large systems into components and, um, and uh, creating an uh, encapsulated system that you can build upon. Uh, whereas functional programming, it's very, very powerful when it comes to um, uh, smaller level of abstractions, like you're piping things throughout the system and you're creating um, um, new um, things to do out of the smaller uh, units. Um, and uh, we're also merging the, you know, the conciseness and uh, a lightweight syntax with uh, uh, something that is statically typed. Because um, so st uh, statically typed is a feature of Scala, but there's a lot of people who would disagree that statically typed is a feature. Uh, they would say, like, um, well, that's what I like in my dynamic language, that it's not statically typed. So that, that is an argument. But uh, I think uh, in Scala, we have managed to sort of uh, bring what, what is good but dynamic programming, which is uh, not having a very concise and lightweight syntax with something that is uh, you know, safe and performant and that scales very well. Uh, so a bit about like, uh, Scala in general as a language. It's, it's existed since uh, about 2001. And uh, in 2006, I think, Twitter, uh, they, uh, they migrated from Ruby to uh, Scala using a framework called Lyft. And, uh, and uh, after that, they've been using that. So there's a lot of um, different uh, web applications that, that uses the same sort of um, uh, frameworks as uh, Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn and Foursquare um, uh, are examples of them. So uh, Scala is, the point here is basically that Scala is a mature language. Uh, there's a lot of uh, languages that tries to unify, that, that runs on the JVM these days, <laughs> and there's a lot of languages that uh, sort of tries to unify the functional, uh, or do functional programming, or uh, tries to unify object-oriented programming and functional programming on the JVM. But uh, Scala, I think, is one of the most mature of them. Uh, but I guess that's what I think, so. <laughs> I'm the Scala guy, right? So that would, that's what I would say. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, so we have Twitter, LinkedIn, Foursquare, uh, web applications, and also uh, you know uh, larger customers like um, EDF and UBS, which uh, are uh, big companies, which are conservative companies, um, but still they're using Scala and if they 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 use it in production. All right, that's enough uh, market talk. So uh, on to the 
code. So this this is a very um, like a short example of what you can do in Scala. So uh, I think this shouldn't scare. The, it's pretty explicit what you what you uh, what we're doing here. So if you see here, we, uh, we have a phone book, and they we're mapping uh, Frederick and Martin, and our numbers, and we're adding uh, Jonas afterwards, and then we're printing it. Uh, what you should know is notice that uh, in, like in in uh, recent languages, we're using we don't we we're, we're inferring the type here, and this is actually a a, a parameterized a generic um, uh, map. But it's actually inferring uh, that it's a string and then to an int map, and it's also inferring that phone book is a map uh, of uh, strings and ints, as you can see here. So uh, this is—I I think this is a very short uh, and concise uh, syntax, either, even though it's um, you know statically typed. If we were to do something wrong here, if I were to have a method that doesn't exist on uh, you know map uh, string to int, uh, I wouldn't be—it wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't compile. So. I think that's pretty sweet. So, um, hmm. <laughs> all right, and um, it's also uh, pretty high level. So I don't know. Did, did any of you see the um, uh, Java uh, SE8 uh, pres presentation yesterday? Some, yeah, most of you, uh, half of you. All right. So they were presenting closures in uh, in Scala, uh, no, in Java. Um, so which was which is going to come next year. So. Scala, um, it runs on the JVM and it has closures since the beginning. And so this is an example of uh, how you write something with a closure in, in, in Scala. Uh, so uh, I think this is a very, um, uh, very easy to read and easy to understand uh, way of writing this. Uh, so what we're basically doing here is we're saying uh, if there's, uh, if there's a uppercase in the name that exists, I'm going to return a uh, yeah, if it exists, um, so I'm going to return um, a boolean. So if the, if there is such a thing inside of this uh, name here. So if you look at this uh, operator, there's a lot of people, or some people, they don't like this operator. But actually, I don't see why because it's sort of like you can look at it as a form, sort of like a, so each time you iterate through a name here, you're sort of taking each letter and you're putting it into the form. So you take. Uh, uh, F, R, E, D, and then, then you're checking if it's an uppercase or not, and then uh, it returns, obviously, the, the boolean. So it's a very, uh, I think it's a very nice way of writing this. So a bit further, so like, um, this is how you declare a class in, in, in Scala. So you have a, so this is, I'm comparing it to Java here. So um, this is, uh, basically I'm saying a you know, person and then, um, Name and uh, age here, and uh, those are. This is, by the way, this is a uh, val. So this is uh, called a value in Scala. So a value in Scala is something which is immutable. So uh, it's uh, in the early example, you saw something called var, which is a variable. So it's uh, something that you can um, that is mutable. So a var is a mutable. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's a mutable type, and the uh, var vals are basically like final in 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 in, in Java. So I think uh, so. This is a very concise syntax, I think. And if you look at it, it's compared to the what you're doing here in Java. You're like uh, you have a, a name three times here, and age three times here, and here you only have name once and age once. So there's less code and less room for error, but you don't lose anything here in the trans uh, uh, translation. Uh, so it's um, uh, Scala. It's also uh, so I was saying it's uh, object-oriented language, and it's really a pure object-oriented language. Everything is uh, an object in Scala. So uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, this, this uh, I'm adding two uh, uh, floats here or doubles, and um, uh, and basically what's happening under the hood there is that it it replaces this empty room here with a, a dot. And it um, gives you a parenthesis here around this. So it basically, this is the same as this. So you can you have operator overloading in Scala. Uh, so this is basically a normal method uh, on um, a double. And uh, um, and uh, and this is uh, and this is one way to call it. So if you had like a, a name here, you could also replace it by a name, and it would be exactly the same thing. 
Uh, another thing you have in, in Scala is, I'm going to talk a, a bit about it, this later on, it's uh, rich wrapper. So in, in double there's nothing, nothing called um, uh, until, because uh, the uh, Scala double is basically just a, a small wrapper class around uh, the Java double. So, um, um, and it doesn't have a it until there, until it generates like a, a, an iterator on, on the double. Uh, so we have uh, something called implicits that uh, where you can um, add rich wrappers around or already existing uh, um, uh, classes. So I'll show you more about this later. Um, so <laughs> uh, so uh, Scala is also very extensible. So um, uh, say for example you have uh, uh, this code here. Uh, so this is an actor in, in Scala. So in Scala you have actors as well. Um, so an actor is um, uh, I'm going to talk about more about this later in my ACA talk, so if you're more interested in actors, you can come later. But uh, basically an actor is, um, is uh, an encapsulation of something, uh, of state and behavior, and you can uh, only uh, change uh, the state or the behavior on actor by sending messages. Uh, so uh, basically you're here I'm sending like a new request to the server using this uh, operator here, and here I'm reacting uh, on the response from a server. So I'm printing out response, and. Uh, Printing out data, and, and then I'm exiting. Uh, so uh, my point with this slide is basically, this looks like it's uh, you know built into the syntax of Scala, but it's really not. It's uh, this is yeah, anybody who um, who uh, writes Scala code could write this. This is actually just a library on top of Scala, uh, so you could um, you could very easily write your own code that looks like this, and that looks like an integral part of the language. So it's very easy to create like to build. DSL-like structures, and I, I'm, I'm going to show you more about this later on. Okay, so uh, uh, basically, uh, I think Scala is very. It's like, so it's, I don't know if you got this impression yet, but it's very deep. So we have it extensible. We have the, I was talking about the implicit, and it, it makes you a bit scared, or it might seem a, little bit, a bit complicated. But uh, I think it's still very productive because you can still use all the constructs that, that you're us used to. Uh, either if you're com coming from, well, most of us come from the object-oriented world, so uh, uh, you can um, use the constructs from uh, that you're used to and create imperative code in Scala. And you can also, but you can also move and use more advanced concepts like uh, the implicits or uh, fu using functional <coughs> programming um, techniques uh, and so on. So um, sort of the um, uh, end of the. Year. Intro. So uh, <laughs> uh, now I'm going to show you uh, uh, something called traits. It's um, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm going to show you three ways how to use them, and uh, then I'm going to show you a bit how you can do something something similar to duck typing in in Scala. I'm going to talk about functions in Scala, functional programming in general, and, and in Scala, and in particular why it's good, and a bit about data structures. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, a loan pattern example and something called the four comprehensions. And then I'm going to show you uh, Scala pattern matching. And then finally, I'm going to show you uh, implicits, which I talked about later on. So traits. So uh, uh, building uh, software is basically composing stuff. And uh, there's, uh, as I was saying, there's two ways you can compose things. You can look at composing a system in components, or you can look at it as uh, just having uh, building it upwards with uh, small uni units of, um, of uh, work that you build outwards. Uh, so I'm going to start with the uh, above uh, the com uh, system way of composing uh, composing software. Uh, so with the traits. So the trait is sort of like uh, an interface in in um, in uh, in uh, Java, but it it also has um, uh, it also has um, uh, uh, concrete methods here. So concrete method, it's a method that, I, that you have uh, implemented. So you see here, this, this is a trait, and it's uh, philosophical, and um, it's very, it, well, you, can, you can call philosophy, and I can see memory, therefore I am, uh, and she print out that. Uh, but you also, uh, you can also have abstract methods uh, in it, so methods you have to implement later on. Um, so you might be wondering, yeah, okay, so what's the difference between uh, an abstract class, which where you can uh, have an abstract method and 
uh, implement a method and a trait. So the difference is that uh, the way you can uh, that you can um, compose them differently. I'll show you uh, how it's done afterwards. So uh, first way of using it is um, um, using a so-called uh, static composition. This is uh, the official term. But um, so I'm creating a class prog here, which extends this animal class with the philosophy. So when I'm saying with, it uses trait. And so I can call frog dot, uh, I can new up a frog here, and I can say new frog philosophize. And then it will print out um, the I'm consuming memory, therefore I am, which we had uh, on the previous slide. Uh, you can also, so what makes it special is that uh, you can compose it with more than one trait. So uh, here I'm, I had two traits on the earlier slide, it was has legs as well. So uh, here I'm extending animal with philosopher and has legs. So uh, I'll show you more about this later, but um, basically uh, it allows you to compose more, uh, more complicated thing, uh, things and um, uh, when using several different traits, basically. <coughs> and here I'm actually overriding, by the way, philosophy, philosophize. Um, all right. So, uh, um, but you can also use it in uh, another fashion. It's the more dynamic composition. So, uh, so um, I'm in my uh, program and I'm just like newing up something, um, and I'm newing up uh, frog with animal and philosophical. And I'm, I'm not going to uh, reuse this class later on. I'm just going to. Uh, uh, this is one special frog that is in in this instance. It's it's going to be like animal and uh, philosoph philosophical frog, but I could also like new up just like a frog, and I can choose between different uh, traits as I want to. So, um, if you have an order, for example, uh, like this, and you have uh, multiple uh, traits, like so, you can, uh, depending on what, which order you you're facing, you can uh, you can um, you can choose which one you which uh, one of the traits it should uh, be. Like so, this is an order that has all of these traits, but I could also like not have one, of course, and then it would be a different order and so on. So it's a nice way of you know constructing different facets. <coughs> so uh, mm, you can also uh, enrich uh, or already existing interfaces with uh, traits. So in this bit, a bit of cryptic uh, code, um, so this is a trait. It's parameterized by T, and I'm looping over it. So this is the important thing. So I'm looping over it, basically, uh, and I'm taking in a function here. So, um, so I'm just looping here. And I'm doing the, what, what is defined here in the function. And I can uh, enrich an existing uh, uh, interface or class like this. So uh, by using mm, the hash set here, so hash set doesn't have a for each, all right? So I can add, uh, uh, you know, the for each behavior on the hash set if I want to. So I'm doing it up, and I'm using uh, the iterable behavior here. So, and this is a class I, I don't own this class, so it's somebody else who owns this class. But I can use it to ex sort of extend the behavior of it. And here I'm uh, looping. I'm using the for each method that that I defined here in which iterable. So this is a nice way of, you know, uh, uh, adding. Uh, to existing uh, functionality, so you can, uh, in a very like static and nice and elegant way, I think. Um, you can also use uh, sort of like use it like uh, an interceptor uh, in uh, aspect-oriented programming. So here I'm here I'm having a trait and I'm overriding um, add here. So each time I'm doing an add, I'm going to lowercase it. All right. So and it extends the Java util set here. So Basically, usage of it will be something like this. So um, I have a set here. I have my hash set here, and then I'm adding ignore case set. So when I'm adding stuff here, uh, I'm really I'm lower casing it afterwards. So if you see here, um, if I check set contains, it, it will return true on this one. Uh, so it says stackable here. So this is stackable. So you can add more to it as well. So again, I can create something new, which is called Luggable. And then I'm, I'm here I'm just printing out, all right? And I can, uh, so first, 
an example of how you would use it. It's the same, like when I add the set here, bon bonjour, <laughs> um, it will uh, uh, print out bonjour, and then, uh, but I can stack it up with the different uh, sets. So here I'm actually, here I'm using it with luggable set and with ignore case, uh, sets. And the way this, is, this works in Scala is that it linearizes the, the, uh, the inher inheritance. So um, it's going to take uh, the ignore case set first, and then uh, the luggable, and then the hash set add. So if I, add, if I do set add bonjour, it's going to print, it's going to lowercase bonjour, and then it's going to print out add bonjour here. Yeah. I think this is a pretty sweet way of uh, doing something uh, uh, which you know, you know, in other languages might be more complicated. Uh, so I think it's a very nice and elegant way of doing, of composing different behaviors uh, in a very static typed way. So um, another thing that, that sort of like uh, uh, comes from uh, sort of the uh, programming is you have duck typing. So it, this, is, this is a quote, so if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a, it's a duck, right? So if an object has uh, this and this method, and, or and this is this method, it means it must be, uh, and that defines a duck for me, it must be a duck, right? So uh, in, in Scala, uh, you can do this as well. So the way you do this is using structural typing. Uh, so it's basically duck typing done right. So here, I have a, a method called authorize, and I have a target here. And I don't care what type the target is. Uh, what I'm caring about is that the target has a get ACL uh, method that returns ACL. That's what I care about, all right? And then, so I can call it inside of here. And I can use it with anything, all the classes I have that have get ACL, which, which returns ACL. So it's, uh, so I don't even, uh, so I can, uh, so if, as soon as I know um, uh, there's a method there, I can, I can use it later on in my, in my class. So it's a very, uh, and, but if I change the signature of the target that I'm using, so it no longer contains ACL, of course it, that won't compile anymore. So it's a, it's a very nice way of, of doing uh, 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 duck typing. And you, can, and you can actually use this technique to do very, very cool things, for example, uh, there's a lot of ways of actually doing uh, dependency injection without any frameworks in Scala, and this is one of them. I'll uh, let it uh, be an exercise for you to figure out how, uh, or you could look at uh, <laughs> uh, look, you could look at uh, some tutorials on the net if you want to cheat. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, uh, over to functional programming. So there's been a lot of talk about functional programming. If you saw the uh, talk about from Simon uh, the other day, he was talking about like. Uh, Java is also moving into more something more functional, and so why is this so important? And um, I think there's uh, among here is especially one thing that is very important that is the immutable uh, behavior of, that you're creating when you're doing something functional. So um, uh, if you have a pure functional programming program, it means that you have no side effects wh whatsoever. So in the purest form. Um, you know, a, a pure, pure functional language, it would be just something that heats up your processor because it won't do anything because it's side effect free, so nothing happens, right? So you're just heating up your, you're just doing a lot of uh, calculations. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Scala isn't entirely uh, functional uh, and there's no languages that are completely side effect free because that wouldn't be any point to it, but uh, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, but Scala is, um, you're encouraged by use, to use mut immutability. So I was talking about the vals and the vars earlier, and uh, the val is sort of like the encouraged way of using stuff in Scala because it's the immutable way. Mm. And functional program is, so I put up deterministic here, and of course everybody wants our program to become, to be deterministic, but uh, uh, functional program lets you do it. I will get more into this later on. So. Functional programming is like Lego, right? So you have small reusable pieces with inputs and outputs, and you just, you're just like composing them together. Uh, so this is like uh, where the traits, I was composing stuff up with my classes, I'm composing you know, small units of functions here. Uh, and this, is, this works great. I mean, uh, in, 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 in Unix, this like cat file, and you're grepping for something. This is like, a, this is one of the things that makes Bash so powerful, really. So, 
Um, uh, compared to other, uh, you know, shell languages at the, at the time, you know, piping is, makes Bash really cool because you can do a lot of powerful things with small units of, you know, very determined uh, in, um, inputs and outputs. So how this functions looks like look like in, in, in Scala. So this is um, uh, an anonymous function in, in Scala. So here I'm defining um, x as an int. So uh, my my method here is going to take an int, and um, uh, or my function, and then uh, I'm going to increment it by one here. So uh, pretty easy. Uh, so this is the way I would, I can use it. So I can I can uh, let uh, val be a uh, be this, because in Scala, uh, a function is actually a value. So this, uh, this works, so this is just like a, a define, really, or like a def, or like a function, uh, uh, because you're just saying this, uh, and you can use it as a function as well, like so. So this is actually, a, this has a type, and it's something that takes an int and returns an int. That's the type of this, and, uh, and it's a, a value. And it's very important, in, um, or it's one of the things that makes it makes Scala functional. So you can use uh, functions as, as parameters, which makes uh, this whole thing higher order. So you have functions as values, right? And you can pass them downwards as parameters in a, in a, in a function, in another function. So here, at map, it takes a function that um, returns that uh, takes in uh, an integer and returns an integer. This is because uh, in this case it does that. So uh, this is the first way of writing it and you saw this notation earlier on. So this is the like long way of writing it, uh, very explicit. And this is like more inferenced and this is like even more condensed. Uh, I like this form a lot because I think this is uh, the most readable way of using it, but you can write it like this as well, if you like it. And of course, everything is like st uh, statically typed and, and checked. So if, uh, if, uh, this was the uh, if this was a value and you changed it uh, to something that would break the code, it, yeah, it would break on compile time. So you have uh, functions. Uh, functions are, um, are as closures in, 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 uh, in, in Scala. So what, what does that mean? It means, uh, so we can close over like uh, free variable outside of the lexical scope. Like, uh, so what, what's more here, right? More, it, it takes it from somewhere else in the scope. So if I did like seven here, uh, this is going to know, it's going to look for a more and it's going to take that one, which is the first in the scope. And then going to increment it by X, which is three, 10. And then I'm changing more and it's going to change the behavior, uh, so it's going to be 11. Uh, another thing in functions in, in Scala, which, are, which was a cool feature, is uh, currying. So currying is when you have two different uh, sets of parameters. So here I have name, that's one set, and session, that's another set. And I'll, I'm going to show you why this is, why this is nice afterwards. Uh, uh, in Java, they were also talking about the long pattern, and the long pattern is something you can um, uh, already create in in in, uh, in Scala as it is. Um, so, um, what's the long pat pattern? Basically, it's when you have a resource that you want to free up after you used it. So here I have a, a file, and um, I'm so I'm going to write it with some uh, print writer here, and and the writer is the resource I want to open up and free after usage. So here I'm going to, uh, on the file, I'm going to um, write print thing. And then, so bef before, before this happens, I'm going to open it. And then if, if something happens here in, in the scope here, I want it to close up. So I want it to be surrounded by a try catch. So uh, you can mod create control structures like this in, in Scala. And this is the way you would do it. So here I have, um, uh, I'm currying it, so I have a, a file here, and then I have a, a body that takes a print writer and returns a unit. And then I'm uh, newing up my print writer here. I'm writing it uh, using I'm using the writer here, and uh, and then I'm closing up the writer. So I'm freeing up. So in my finally, so if something happens here in the body, I'm uh, I'm fine. I'm going to close up the resource and. Uh, 
we are going to live uh, happily ever after. Uh, another cool thing when we were talking about this is uh, uh, call by name. It's, this is a feature in, in Scala. So uh, uh, again, uh, there's a lot of, I think, um, I don't know uh, if Scala has in influenced uh, Java 8, but uh, there's a lot of things that are similar for, uh, on uh, these slides and what, you, uh, what you're going to perhaps have in, in Java 8. Uh, so, uh, so, this is, uh, but, um, so this is the way you would write it, or similar to this. So you would say, uh, if I have a sort function here and I don't take anything in an input here, I just want to return, I just want a function that returns a boolean, but I don't need any inputs because my assert is going, it's just going to check my predicate and then throw an assertion error. I probably want to have something else here uh, if, if this is an assert uh, or, or something. But uh, anyways, uh, so if this uh, if sentence here is true and I want to throw an assertion error. Uh, but the way you would have to write this in Scala is like the same as you did earlier, like if you look at this, you would have, here you had um, a writer and since you don't have anything here, you just have to write uh, this and then uh, towards uh, for bigger than two. So I just really, I really, this is the essential part here. But I don't want this to be called uh, before uh, uh, this is actually called. I want to be able to call pred predicate here. But, and only when I call predicate, this is going to evaluate. Because if not, it, it would be like, uh, I wouldn't be really checking. Uh, the other uh, uh, whatever I might have in the if might have in the if here, uh, and um, it won't work as I want it to work. So I can write it like this, uh, just without this thingy here, equals boolean, and I can write it like this, and this will actually evaluate only when I call it here. So this is this is very pr uh, cool, and it makes you makes it able it makes it possible to create like uh, very powerful control structures again. So uh, um, I can't like, uh, there's a lot of things, uh, cool things in, in Scala, uh, functional data structures is, is one of them. So, uh, uh, so let's talk about a bit about functional data structures because it's very important. I'm saying uh, Scala is a functional programming language, but um, if Scala is a functional programming language, it's very important to have functional data structures because if not, they would not be efficient and it would look strange. So. Uh, the first, uh, I, I already used this, so the first uh, sort of data structure you use in, in Scala is, is the list. So the list is sort of uh, the uh, normal, the most normal uh, data structure you have. It's um, uh, very quick, it's like constant time prepend. So it's very quick to prepend stuff in lists. So you can use it like uh, this, or I can use it like in a more functional manner like this. Um, so here I'm actually um, I'm prepending to nil, which is a list. Uh, this is an empty list, and I'm prepending to it using this const operator here. Um, the, so um, this is just a simple usage so of it. So you've seen this before. You have head and tail, and is empty, which is the you know the constant time operations that you would use on lists. So if you, if you are in within the expanders, you should use lists. Um, so uh, methods on lists, so uh, these are, um, so uh, uh, it's very important to have like uh, the standard collection methods, which are uh, map and filter and flat map and folding, which uh, are very, very useful. Like when you get, get too comfortable with the functional programming of doing things, this is very, very nice way of of, uh, of using, uh, of uh, manipulating lists. List is sort of like the uh, default construct, right? And you want to be able to manipulate it in a very nice manner. So uh, the map bit, uh, so as we saw earlier on, the map bit, it just takes, you know, uh, whatever you had here before, it takes one element here, and then it does something with it. And what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying by two. So this is a list of two to four to six. Uh, this, that's the ret uh, return value of this uh, operation here. And likewise, I can do a, a filter operation, which basically says if this is true, I'm going to return uh, the elements from this um, list. I can also do um, uh, something called flat map. Uh, it's very useful when you start to be comfortable with it, but uh, 
it might be hard to get your head around, but it's actually just a, a map, and then you're, you're flattening afterwards. So if, I had, um, if I'm mapping over uh, this, you would uh, uh, map on, uh, on, uh, on the whole uh, sequence here. Or, so a string is a sequence in Scala, so you would map, map over this sequence of, uh, of characters, which is really a string, right? Um, so, and then, uh, so but what you're doing here is that you're actually, uh, you're doing this operation and then you're flattening it down. So this will return uh, a list of, um, of uh, characters, actually, because it's going to flatten the sequence which is here after it has done this. Uh, it's pretty complicated, but once you, it's really nice when you start to, to feel comfortable with functional programming, this is a very, very nice uh, structure. Um, also, you have the fold left, which sort of like folds to the left of this operation. So if you had like, a, here you're, you're taking, you're starting off with zero. So I'm putting zero here and I'm taking one. And then I'm taking some parentheses on that. And then I'm taking, adding it with two. And then I'm adding it, the result of that again with three. So uh, there's different uh, ways of uh, remembering what, what is a fold left and what is a, um, uh, and what's the fold right? Because there's something called fold right as well. But the fold left, uh, the parentheses they're going to stack up on the left side. So that's the way, one way to remember it. And there's also a very cool, uh, another cool data structure. I, I just have to sort of like uh, remind you about. If you're using Scala, you should definitely try uh, to s to have a look at the, this implementation, the vector. Because uh, so this is this this got me at least when I'm. When I started off with Scala, I, I used list everywhere, but list isn't the most efficient uh, data structure for doing most of the things that you're actually doing because uh, uh, usually, or some, sometimes you're, you're prepending, which is fine, so you're using list. But here, uh, uh, with a vector, you have constant time, append, first, last, uh, you know, getters, and updates. So it's really a very, you know, you have all these operations which are constant time. So if you're doing something with a large data structure, you should definitely use the vector. And another uh, a, a bit funny fact about uh, the vector, it's written by a guy called Phil Bagwell, which is the marketing guy at TypeSafe. <laughs> so our marketing guy actually created this uh, bitmap vector try, which is like a blazingly fast, uh, super uh, data structure, which you should definitely check out when, if you get into uh, functional programming and Scala. Uh, but it's actually written by a marketing guy. How about that? <laughs> um, all right, so uh, last data structure I want to talk about is the tuples. So it's uh, not, not as fancy as the vector, but uh, it's very useful. In Scala, oh, in Java, you would have to create like a data class uh, if you wanted to return two, two different uh, values, which we want to do here. and. Um, uh, uh, but here you just like simply say I want to return a uh, name and age here. Uh, and uh, so if I use it, I can do something like this. Uh, so let's go back to functional programming. So um, uh, this is a quote about functional programming that I think it's nice is, uh, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to do concurrency without uh, functional programming, you're treating the symptom uh, not this is so uh, basically it says that you know uh, uh, yeah I mean at, at, at the end as soon as you don't do it, do it functionally and you're doing something trying to do something concurrently it might it will bite you in the ass and you will have to sort of like use locks and it gets more complicated and and how how do you reason about it it's very hard to reason about it so uh, I was talking about immutability before and so this is sort of like so we had functional uh, functional programming and immutability so why is this uh, so important? I mean, uh, who cares, right? Uh, and you should all care because uh, today, now, uh, you know, uh, most of your, uh, my, my MacBook Pro, uh, MacBook Air, a small uh, one uh, kilo, it has uh, like four logical uh, cores, two real cores and uh, hyper-threading. Uh, so it's like, it's a powerful, uh, <laughs> computation unit, but if I'm not programming uh, concurrently, I'm only using one fourth of the resources I have available on my, on my computer, which is a shame, of course. So, uh, but it's very hard to, to do it uh, with, I mean, 
as soon as you start with threads, I mean, it's, it's, it's enough in the, in the small, uh, concise cases, but as soon as you, it blows up, I mean, it gets very, very complicated to reason about. And, and uh, I'll just have a look at, at this. So you have, um, so here I'm saying non-determinism non is uh, due to mutable state and, you know, parallelism. This is, you get uh, non-determinism when you have mutable state and parallel uh, processing. So uh, have a look at this example. So you have a var x equals zero. So var is a mutable uh, variable in Scala. You are assigning it to zero. And then I'm doing uh, an async oper operation here. And I'm starting an async operation here. And depending on the weather, uh, if you ate lunch uh, before 12 o'clock today and uh, a lot of other variables, you might get zero, one, or two as a result here. I mean, you, it's impossible for you to say which of these actually, uh, how this uh, reacts, this whole uh, thing. Uh, so I'm just starting up two threads here, and already this is pretty complicated. I, I, I couldn't tell you what val uh, value x, is, x has at the end here. So you should try to avoid mutable state. So that's the point here, because if you had avoided mutable state here, you would, it would be deterministic, and you would know what x was at the end there. Uh, and therefore, you should program functionally. So that's the reason why it's so important. Uh, so uh, an example of this is, uh, again, uh, it's uh, our implementation of parallel collections in, in, in Scala, which is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, you're invited to, to, to have a look at it, of course. Uh, so here I'm, I have uh, my list of people here, all right? And I want to partition them. So I want to partition the people, uh, each pe people, there's lots of persons in people, and uh, in, uh, a person has a name, all right? So I'm going to take for uh, each uh, person in people, I'm going to take, I'm going to look at their name, and I'm going to put everything that is less than eight, that has a, a person that has age less than eight into one group, minors, and I'm going to put the other into uh, uh, another group, uh, called ad adults. Uh, and if I add this, and this is it, this will execute parallelly on uh, your course. So if you have eight cores, for example, this is going to boot up. Uh, there's, it's, I mean, there's uh, some heuristics behind it, but um, you know, if, if this is like a huge list, and uh, this is uh, or, um, a huge set of people, and this is um, uh, your, it's an expensive calculation, uh, you would have a theoretical uh, um, a boundary, uh, like, or you would boot up, you would boost your speed with uh, this calculation here by eight, basically, the number of recourse. And it actually, it works surprisingly well. I mean, um, it works surprisingly well. So you only have to write this little thing here to get the whole, the statement paralyzed. And uh, you can, I, I was telling you, you can compose stuff in functions. So. Imagine you're composing your whole program in, in functions, and you're just adding par when you're, once you're done, and then it will boost your uh, up, uh, calculation by, by the number of cores you have available. I mean, that's, that's great, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, related to uh, uh, functional programming in Scala, uh, for those of you who found, found the map and the flat map and the filter a bit like hard to read, uh, we have something called the four comprehensions in Scala. So the four comprehensions is, it looks like a for loop in, in Java. So you have, um, here I'm iterating, or I'm, this is a generator, so I'm generating a uh, name for na in the names, and then I'm printing out the name here. So this is one way of using four comprehensions, but it's much more powerful than a for loop. So you can use it like this. Uh, so um, here we have, uh, here I'm, selecting all attendees that is named Fred and, and speaks French. So, uh, so uh, this is what I want to do. So this is, uh, um, uh, here I'm, 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 I'm generating uh, an attendee, right? And then I'm, I'm, I'm using a guard error to say uh, if, uh, oh, it's a syntax error. Can anybody spot it, the syntax error? Oh God. Uh, yeah, it's there, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so uh, uh, so I'm checking if uh, the name of uh, the attendee is, is, is Fred, and then uh, I'm uh, checking if the spoken languages 
of that attendee. Um, we're generating those, checking if it's French. And if it is, I'm going to print out the attendee. All right? And actually, um, um, so it says SQL like lock here. So, I mean, this is nice. I mean, in your code, uh, it's very, it's readable. It's a way of like, it's a great way of, you know, taking a list and manipulating, you know, collections of stuff, right? So it's a great way. Uh, so um, there's this guy who created uh, called Stefan Zeiger, who works at the TypeSafe as well. And he created uh, uh, a fork comprehension that actually generates SQL. So uh, it actually generates uh, based on, you know, th if this was a data structure, like uh, an entity, uh, it's an ORM layer basically. So, it, so if this was an entity or the attendee was an entity and we're looping over those, uh, we can actually, you can actually um, uh, get uh, the result output of, uh, you know, this, uh, well, uh, not the print line, but this, uh, you, could, uh, you could actually get, um, uh, you know, a SQL generated statement uh, in a type safe manner using this for conference. Uh, I will so show you the next slide, so it makes more sense. So this is, here I'm actually returning something. So I'm using uh, um, the yield operator in, in Scala. So here I'm actually yielding. So I'm, uh, again, I'm looping over the attendees, checking if the city is uh, London this time, and I'm yielding the company of the attendee, all right? And if this was, uh, if there, if this was uh, on, uh, an entity, using Scala query, this would actually be like a, a query that I could execute or that uh, somebody could execute for me on my SQL uh, database, which is pretty cool. So uh, I'm saying it looks, it's, it builds something that can be looked at, at as a data structure. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, it, it generates something that looks like a data structure, but it doesn't need necessarily have to be a data structure. So this could be a list, but it could also be like a SQL statement, which is sort of like, uh, a collection of stuff, basically, from your database in the future, perhaps, if the database is up. So, basically, um, in Scala, everything returns uh, a statement. And this is very important when you're programming in Scala, is that you should try to, uh, uh, you're encouraged to build stuff like this. Uh, because, uh, and use, uh, um, basically, uh, expression-based uh, or, or expression-oriented uh, programming, as it's called, uh, because that, that way you would you would never have like a, uh, if I would in Scala in, in Java, for example, I would say uh, I would create a uh, you know a mutable uh, mutable uh, uh, um, instance of my things, my list there, and then I would loop over it and I would put stuff in this uh, um, uh, list uh, and. Uh, I mean, I have a, I have a mutable uh, variable, and that that is really dangerous. And I mean, it could break. It could be a, a non-thread safe, and it's something I don't want. So, if I'm doing it like this, I'm I'm always in, within the boundaries of something mutable. So I'm I'm programming with uh, expression oriented, and um, uh, so you could extend it like this, and, and if as well, it will um, actually return something. So I could do uh, an if here and do something here, here, and I would actually get like a, very, a response out of this. So all the way here, I'm doing lots of logic here, but I'm always, I'm always, I never ever have a mutable variable. So I'm doing lots of stuff without do, doing uh, something mutable, which is very good because that way I can, you know, eas more easily parallelize what I'm doing. I have less state to worry about. <coughs> uh, so, uh, um, Try catches, they also um, return uh, values. So if I do a try catch here, uh, so here I'm returning a list, here I'm returning a list, and here I'm also returning an empty list. So, uh, you know, we can compose it outwards uh, in this nice manner. Uh, in the same way, we have uh, so we have something called uh, we have pattern matching in Scala. So we, this is sort of like a, a switch statement on on steroids. So uh, pattern matching is so in, in in Java you can do pattern matching on on, on ints and uh, on strings now, and uh, and uh, but in Scala you can you can do it on whatever type you want. So here I'm I'm actually I'm just checking if if 
this is whatever a is like if a is uh, one i'm going to give out one there and, and so on you can see what's going on here uh, the only a bit like fuzzy thing is perhaps this one so um here i'm actually i'm saying if a is uh, if a has a head and i can compose it using the cons operator here and it has a tail so if it has two elements composed by the cons operator i'm going to return a head so this is very fancy this is uh, called uh, extraction uh, and it's a very fancy way of uh, of doing pattern matching so you can do uh, it's more it's not only like matching directly up against the values of things but you can actually extract and divide in the in in the pattern match itself uh, by the way this is the default case so it's underscore again it's the sort of default uh, so this brings up up to uh, to, to to case classes which is a, a special way of, of, of doing um, uh, uh, classes is uh, it basically gives you um, these uh, methods and enables you to do uh, pattern matching very easily like this so here I'm actually I'm creating a then and it, this was give you a warning by the way but this will you know check if if the if it's ben and i'm going to extract actually the age here and i'm going to print the edge uh, so you can use guards as well with pattern matching like so so it brings me uh, so this is uh, so earlier i was saying you can enrich uh, already existing classes uh, in scala and and one way to do this is with the implicits so uh, i was talking about this one so I was telling you, I was promising you, I would get into this. So how does this work? And the way this works is that uh, here I have a, uh, so this is not the actual implementation by the way, but imagine I had like a class called which double here. It takes a double and it gives me the possibility to create, uh, to use a method called until here. And it does something. So it creates a generator and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then I'm, I'm gonna create uh, an implicit uh, def here, over here uh, that uh, takes a uh, two rich double here and it's going to create uh, so each time it finds a double and when it needs to use until it's going to create an instance of which double on the uh, uh, on the double that I had earlier uh, another way that you can use this is on parameters so it, it implicit, they go up in the scope and look for stuff that it can insert. So imagine I have a, had like a, a find there and it's, uh, it operates on a session. Let's say it's using, it's trying to find uh, a name in a, or a person in a database by its name, all right? So you, you have the name here and you have the session. And what you really want to do is you want to write it like this. And using the implicit, I can create an implicit val here that implicitly creates uh, the session here. So if it didn't have a session available in the scope, in the scope here, it would fail. But since I have an implicit val, which is of type session, I can, I can use it like this. So it, it creates much more readable code and it sort of like um, um, extracts a lot of complexity away from you. So um, you, can do, you can do this in multiple ways. So you can pimp libraries like this. So this is a way to so it's, it's, this is the pattern, it's pimp my, by my library pattern. And it's very cool, so you can do like, this is a string, right? And I'm doing the same as I did with the, the double. I, c I create a print here. Um, and uh, one example of this in, in the wild is the Scala test. So here I'm actually, here I can take uh, a stack, should pop values in, in. So here I have uh, actually a method here that takes in a string, like so. And then it returns something that takes in an in as well. So I can create this type of structure here. And here I have, a, I have something, I have an int. And an int doesn't have a should, should, right? Because, I mean, it doesn't have a should, but if I import uh, the implicits in the scope, in the scope of this class, I can use should on the ints, and I can do create very readable code like this. So. That was uh, sort of my uh, uh, overview of Scala. I hope you, uh, um, I hope you did, are not too tired, and uh, it's with <laughs> a lot of concepts and so on. So uh, if you get room for more, um, I have a talk later on Akka.
so uh, I was promising resources. So uh, the thing I really want to mention is uh, a book called Programming in Scala, which, uh, where you can read about all the things. Even if you're not interested in Scala, I would still recommend reading this because it's a great, great book. It's very easy to read. Uh, I read it uh, when I was on vacation, and it's like uh, vacation literature. It's like nice, nicely, really nicely explained and written, and it's really comprehensible. Uh, of course, you can check out Scala Lang and you know Twitter and and the user groups and so on. And you have um, a, a, a book uh, on our on our site. You can uh, download uh, from typesafe.com if you wanna. Uh, it just if when you come into typesafe.com, you have a link. Uh, so you can download that book. Uh, and there's also this great book, Beginning Scala, and fr from David Pollock. And that's about it. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. If you don't have any questions, I can, you can talk later on as well, so. Yeah. Uh, so um, Scala is developed by um, uh, an institute called EPFL in, in Lausanne, and um, uh, so um, it's open source code and uh, um, TypeSafe. What we do, we provide commercial support uh, on on Scala. So um, uh, you know, consulting trainings and uh, and support uh, on issues in Scala. So we have uh, a commercial backed up, but it's an open source project. So anybody can contribute. Uh, we actually created a new way of, um, of contributing. Um, so it's sort of like the um, JSRs, JSRs. So you can do it in, in, uh, in Scala. So you can write your own. You can uh, contribute. It's called a SIP in Scala. You can uh, contribute to new features if you want to. Um, so there's a committee at the UPFL that e evaluates if it's good enough or if it takes stuff into the language. So that's sort of the relationship. Yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, for us it's, uh, I think, uh, programming in general is, uh, so I've been following this uh, complexity discussion a bit on, on the internet, and, and uh, I mean, uh, I think Scala is just like any other programming language. Uh, it, it's really hard to do hard, to solve hard problems, and, uh, uh, but it gives you a lot of tools, it gives you a lot of power, I think. Um, one thing that uh, you know scares people off sometimes is uh, the APIs in Scala, because they are very. Uh, if you looked at the flat map, uh, I didn't know if you saw it. Uh, uh, the flat map API it had like generics inside of there, and if you just want to use it, uh, or like the map or whatever like operator that actually has generics in it, uh, you just want to use it. You're not interested in. Maybe you, you you want to use it in your four comprehensions, but you don't understand why, why how the API actually maps to the four conferences and so on and, and, and so on. So using it in four conferences is really easy. It's very easy to read, but looking at the API is really hard. And, and we are trying to, to improve that. So we're really thinking about how, how ways of how to improve it, giving better examples, better documentation, creating better doc, uh, do, you know, documentation in Scala docs, um, automatic generation of better Scala docs. So I mean, mm, uh, yeah, no, we, we definitely want, don't want Scala to be looked upon as like a very hard, like a, the hard language. We don't want that, of course. But um, yeah. pretty cool because at least the part I saw were start of interesting discussion, but very quickly became sort of flame wars, like <coughs> Scala guys versus other guys. And to me personally, I think it's pity. I mean, valid arguments at some point. Maybe wrong opinion, but somehow I guess should you guys, in order to answer call as cheating, you should address it in some way. Both sides just flaming is just yeah, just stupid. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, <laughs> it's being it, it's really a flame war now, and I don't think anything can good co can come from that discussion. But I think we are. Uh, I mean, Martin, he definitely Martin, the creator of Scala, he sees. Uh, the concern about Scala being too complex, and we are definitely trying to find ways, but I, I can't promise exactly how we're going to solve. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Yes? Sounds to me you're just trying to keep the problems there. Huh? Shouldn't you just accept that some people think Starlight is too complex and let them use Java or whatever they like? Although, I mean, uh, Scala is sort of like Martin's baby and he, he obviously wants to, you know, the whole world to use it, so uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he could let only 5% use it, but I think uh, he really believes that it's uh, a, a great way of developing code and he wants, you know, everybody to take advantage, advantage of it. And, uh, and uh, so obviously, you know, the complexity, this complexity thing is a, a real concern. We're discussing it all the time. So it's not something I'm saying now. It's something we are aware of and we're trying to figure out how ways of make it like making it less complex. But I mean, we're not going to change like fundamentals of the language, right? Okay, so thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>